It's a really great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight um, and to see these groups together. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Oz Schmitz and the rest of the folks with the Yale Institute of Biospheric Studies for uh, sharing this evening with us, with this, which is a euphemism for doing much of the organization and support. So um, thank you, Oz, and uh, everybody else. And um, it's really great to see uh, the leadership councils here uh, tonight. Um, I, I heard that the YIBS meeting went really well uh, today, and I hope that bodes well for uh, the Peabody Council tomorrow. And um, it's particularly great to see these groups all together, along with uh, some of our friends from around campus, um, with the staff of the museum. And um, I hope everyone will hang around afterwards for uh, the reception. And it is a particular pleasure to be able to introduce Kirk Johnson here today. So uh, Kirk is someone who um, I have been kind of uh, following his career for, for many years. Um, Kirk started off, uh, well, he grew up in Seattle, um, then did what very few people uh, in Seattle ever do. He left and he went to college uh, on the East Coast at Amherst where he studied uh, geology and art then did a, a master's at Penn before he finally figured out where he needed to be and came here. And he worked uh, with Leo Hickey um, doing uh, some fantastic paleobotany work. And, and when we were walking around campus today, he was kind of looking at wonderment at what the campus looked like off of uh, Science Hill. And I was thinking, well, how much has this changed? And he said, well, I've only been off, camp uh, off of Science Hill about 20 times. Um, so th that's the way we like it with our graduate students. Um, so uh, after uh, finishing his degree here, um, he spent some time in Australia uh, postdocing there, and we got to talk about that because I postdocked in Australia as well. Um, Kirk was uh, based in Adelaide, but spent a lot of time uh, in one of my favorite places up on the Cape York Peninsula, uh, working in the rainforest up there, which is one of the most special places on the whole planet. And then he moved to another pretty special place, uh, to Denver, where um, he became a, a curator at the Denver Museum of uh, Nature and Science, which is a great institution, um, which became greater over uh, the decades that he was there. As he moved up through the curatorial ranks, uh, became chief curator and ended up being uh, vice president for research and took on more and more responsibility first for um, redesigning some of their wonderful exhibits um, and, and then doing, uh, at least I can say in this room, the famous project uh, Snow Mastodon, which um, got so much uh, coverage for the great stuff that was uncovered and how quick um, they, they, they got all that done. And, and in general, just being part of a, a museum out there in Denver that as uh, Jacques told me uh, earlier today, is just always guns blazing. You know, they're, they're always uh, doing something new out there, and that's fantastic. Um, Kirk has uh, written a number of books. Um, the one, uh, you know, I, I love reading about plants in the KT boundary as much as the next person, but uh, my, my favorite is the one that he did with Ray Troll, um, uh, which, which is kind of cruising through the fossil record, and there's another one on the way that he was just telling me about um, that's, that sounds really exciting as well. So. Kirk, somebody who has tremendous credibility from a scientific perspective, um, has shown that he also really understands how people who are not scientists see what we do and the value of it. Um, and so for that reason, uh, when I was thinking about somebody uh, who could help us think about the future of places like this, I couldn't think of anybody better than, than Kirk. So let's just welcome him. Thank you, David. That was a great introduction, and it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. It's, uh, it's like going back in time, a quarter of a century, and everyone is here. It's really cool. Uh, I want to talk to you today about the natural history museum industry. And most people don't call it an industry because they sort of think of a natural history museum here and one there. And it's a very curious industry because it's uh, an old industry. There's not many many kinds of things that were invented in the 18th and 19th century that are still in play today. But somehow, natural history museums, which are markedly 19th century inventions tied to the simultaneous exploration of the world and the urbanization of its populations, um, largely growing out of Europe and, and eventually in North America. You can see that the big, a lot of the big museums of the world arc through the 19th century. And you have to ask yourself, how many other 19th century institutions are still going strong in this really transformative landscape? And as a, a museum person, I um, 
find myself curiously lodged in the director's office of the National Museum, and I'm uh, now intensely interested in the health and future of not just the big museum in Washington, D.C., but the what museums can do in the 21st century. So my central question I ask myself kind of every day is, how do you use a 19th century tool in the 21st century? And then secondarily, what does it actually mean to be the National Museum? So those are kind of the arcing things. And I want to take you through a narrative uh, and hopefully in, in, uh, embed you with a few thoughts and maybe questions for tomorrow as the boards meet about how do we do this? How do we use this 19th century tool for the 21st century? And I, my, my wife makes boots. She, she has a 19th century job as well. She has, she makes cowboy boots and she has like 25 hammers. There's a toe hammer and a heel hammer and a sole hammer. And, and watching her, it, it's very uh, important to, to recognize that when you have a job to do, you need the right tool for the job. So that, you, know, you think about that. You don't cut something with a screwdriver and you don't, you know, you don't uh, use a pair of pliers to take a bottle cap off the top. So there's this dual thing, like we have this tool, this 19th century tool, the museum, and we have a bunch of challenges in the 21st century and that's our, that's our challenge. How do we take this very specific tool and use it for our new and evolving and very rapid challenges? It's a big question for us. Uh, one of my heroes is this guy who you may or may not have ever heard of. This is George Brown Good. He was the first director of the National Museum in Washington, D.C. And he was uh, active. Um, as you know, he, he was a young man when he died. He died at the age of 46. He was a director of the museum for 15 years. He came on board to help organize the um, Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876. And he, so he sort of got his teeth at the end of the 19th century after it had been a, a, a more or less a century of museums that were really collections of objects in service of research. And he was what they were, one of the uh, many people they called the new museum men. He had a new idea, and his idea was really that it's not just research and objects, it's actually the audience, too. You have to build things for the audience. So he led a movement to start recasting museums as places where the public got to spend time with these objects that the scientists were getting insights from. And so he framed this thing, Natural History Museum should advance three parallel missions, specimen preservation, the collections, scientific research, the new knowledge, and public education was a new concept, and it, it, this was kind of what levered all these museums into place around the 1890s and early 1900s, was this concept that museums are this curious place where people and really cool objects and scholarship could commingle. And in many ways, he's dead right today. I mean, there are these three elements, the three legs of the stool, and this, you think about natural history museums, every one of them has these three components that are a triple bottom line, a triple mission. You could put these things together and put the collections at the core and surround them by expertise and surround them by audience if you wanted to. Uh, but I always look at a museum and go, how healthy are all three of these things? Is the science strong and robust? Is it doing good work? Are the collections in great shape? Are we having an active collecting program? Are they well curated? Are they being well used? And is the audience actually getting something out of it that really thrills them and inspires them and makes them, enlightens them? And that's my measure. I'm always looking at museums through those three, three lenses. And of course, when you work in a museum, you're usually in one of those lenses looking out, which makes the continuing and ongoing tension that lives in every natural history museum that's ever lived, where you have a perspective. And having started out as a tiny child, uh, hanging out in museums and then sort of slowly moving my way through the entire spiral of museums and looking back down on it from this weird position I have at the Natural History Museum, I, I still hang on this, this issue and really just valued objects, new knowledge, and communication. So here I am at this uh, absurd museum on the mall with 400 research scientists, 7 million visitors a year, and 128 million objects. It's, it's a remarkably daunting prospect in any one of its aspects. We routinely get, this time of year, 25 to 30,000 people a day in the museum. We can, you know, it's just think about that. We can do your annual attendance of the Peabody Museum in a week. It is the most visited National History Museum in the world and the second most visited museum after the Louvre of any kind in the world. And one of the reasons it's free and on the mall in Washington, D.C. 
But if you think about natural history museums, they come in many flavors, right? They're not just all of one kind. In fact, there are a whole lot of different flavors. They're the national museums of the world. There's the state museums, the city museums, the county museums, university museums, college museums, museums that stand alone or private, and these hybrid museums, things like the university museum that's also the state museum, or the city museum that's part private. So when you think about museums and why they're hard to understand the industry, and it's actually very hard to understand the industry, is because the industry is completely fragmented. There are small groups like Spinach that, that pay attention to the collections of natural history museums, but there's really no um, serious organization around natural history museums globally. And the other thing is that they're, they come in all sizes. Some are huge, like the National Museum, and some are tiny. There's something like six or seven or 8,000 natural history museums in the world, and there's a lot of them. Together they hold something like five billion objects. You want to think about this, so there's more or less an object for every person on the planet in a museum somewhere. And those collections represent what our species has assembled to understand the planet it lives on. I mean, these collections are really profoundly important, important things. Now, my, uh, the structure of this tale is going to start with me, because I'm just going to take you through the kinds of museums that I've experienced and give you some examples to sort of bring the thing. But here is me at age 18 months with my first pickaxe, an ice axe. And my dad was a mountaineer, and so I got to get outside and crawl around a lot, and I found a lot of stuff. So I was immediately a finder of things. And when you're a finder of things, you become a collector of things. And when you become a collector of things, you find yourself being drawn towards museums pretty rapidly. And the things that I saw when I was a kid were these incredible fossilized crabs from the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State, these exquisite little crabs that get buried under the seabed in mud, and then somehow the, the, the animal's decaying body catalyzes a concretionary reaction, and the little crabs are preserved in these hard stones. So they're three-dimensional preservation. And they're exquisite things that I really wanted to find when I was a kid. And I finally found a guy who took me to this beach, and I cracked open this rock, and there inside was a crab. And I was done, done, done at the age of 12. <laughs> Straight, solid, sold, packaged up. Now, my first museum, in fact, was not even a museum. It's an amazing place called Ye Old Curiosity Shop. It was, a, it was a shop that opened on the waterfront in Seattle at the time of the Yukon Gold Rush. And it was inside this amazing store was, was everyone's fantasy of like the 19th century cabinet of curiosities. And I would go down to that place and pour over in great detail any number of the different things that were there. But by the time I was 13, my mom was also done, done, done. And she dropped me off at this place, the Burke Museum, which is the University of Washington Museum, which is a state museum and a university museum. And one of the characteristics about university museums is that they actually have relatively small attendance. So it's hard to call them a large museum in some sense because they've got big collections and big curatorial staff, but very small attendance. And in fact, in Seattle, this museum, city of three million people, annual attendance has never been much above 50,000. A third of the Peabody's. Why? It's on a campus, people don't feel comfortable entering a campus, and the 50,000, probably half are students going back and forth. It's, it's really incredible how some university museums, because of their location, do not access the public. It's also got crazy governance, if you think about it. You've got a dean that supervises the director, the director uh, supervises the curators, but actually the department chairs supervise the curators. And since it's a state museum, a state agency also supervises the director, and there's an advisory board. So there's one, two, three, four levels of governance. It makes it very complicated for a museum director in a university to actually move the wheel. It's just that there's too many people with authority or soft authority in how you run the museum. So it's hard to implement strategy, pan-museum strategy in a university museum or state museum. When I was there, I uh, started driving around looking for fossils. And in this little town in northeastern Washington, when I was a kid, I found this layer of rock that split like the pages of the book. And you flip the pages open, and there's exquisite little fossils on these pages, Eocene plant fossils. Um, it, it just incredible things, remarkable fossils. And uh, one of the things about this site was it was full of fossil flowers. We found slabs that had 10 or 15 flowers on a single slab, literally fossilized bouquets of flowers. 
Uh, but just incredible things. And out of that, then and there, sprang up a little museum in the town. Stone Road Center, it's still there. It gets about 15,000 people a year that grew out of this little hole I dug in the side of the ground. And it's in a town of 150 people in the far eastern corner of Washington. It actually drives a part of the economy of the town. And that has no governance at all. There's one employee, and he reports to the mayor of the city. So the scale of these things is quite variable, but it's a natural history museum. I went to Amherst College, which had this lovely gymnasium, which they repurposed to become a natural history museum. The Pratt Museum, it was called. And uh, there, they've now renovated it to the new Amherst Bineski Museum, which is a beautiful museum. But this was a museum full of fossils and things, but in sac it itself was a fossil museum. It wasn't active. There were no curators at all. It was just run by the Depar Department of Geology, so there was a, d a dean that ran the department, and then the department chair had a museum. There was no active collecting, there was minimal programming, it was just a box full of gorgeous fossils from the 19th century. So a mummified museum, if you will. It's changed a little bit now in its renovation, but you know, looking for signs of health in a museum is their research. Are the collections growing? Are there public programming exhibits happening? Is the museum alive or is the museum mummified? And then I met this guy, this amazing guy, Leo Hickey, who many of you know, um, who sadly and prematurely passed away in early 2013, uh, but an amazing guy. He was at the Smithsonian when I first met him and then he moved here to Yale and uh, he took me to the Arctic and blew my mind in 19. 84. We went to this incredible place, and this is a photograph that Leo took, which is still one of my most favorite photographs. It's a picture of the central Izmir ice cap, and you can see a 300-foot high waterfall right there. So you're seeing one of these big ice caps that would have been like what it was here in Connecticut 18,000 years ago, but by going back in time, or going north, you can go back in time. And uh, Leo was like, this really amazing explorer scholar, and we, we trekked to these places. This is actual Heiberg Island, which is the size of, uh, of Ireland and uninhabited, looking for fossils. And there were amazing fossils there at latitude 82 north, these giant coal seams full of standing tree trunks and petrified forests. And of course, if you rooted around the bottom, you'd find the leaves that fell off the trees that grew in those polar forests. And what was remarkable was that 50 million years ago, the high Arctic was a warm forest. This kind of basic knowledge about the planet only comes from exploration, research, and the resulting specimens of the proof of what we know about the history of the planet. And so I realized, you know, the fact that our planet goes between periods of non-ice warm periods and icy pole cold periods, that is not a fact you would know if you didn't have fossils, if you didn't have museums to put those fossils in. So in fact, the obscure collection of random objects starts to tell you stories about the planet that are opaque to you without access to those objects. And of course, I ended up at the Peabody Museum, which for many people is Hiram Bingham, Rudy Zallinger, and O.C. Marsh. And of course, Brontosaurus, long live Brontosaurus. He's <laughs> back. Uh, you know, an amazing place, because O.C. Marsh's uh, uncle was very, in, in, his, in his uncle's family and other parallel families were very good at building museums in New England. And O.C. Marsh, you know, one of the earliest, the earliest North American paleontologists, a great historical place to be and to be in the hallways of this building and, and really kind of relive the history of, of North American paleontology. Uh, again, this is a university natural history museum, so the challenge of running this museum is that the director reports to some sort of dean, but the department chairs supervise the curators and there's an advisory board. So there's at least three levels of governance that you have to negotiate to be the director of this museum. And it's a challenge in any of these university museums how you go about that process. And we're here at a board meeting, so I thought I'd throw that out to have a little conversation starter <laughs> with the hors d'oeuvres later. I went to Denver, which is a, um, it's a standalone museum. It's called the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It used to be the Colorado Museum of Natural History, but it's privately run. A lot of museums started as city museums and then switched over when the city said, hands off, we're not going to do this anymore. That happened for Denver in the 80s. They became 
a private run museum. We don't even really know who owns the museum. Sort of technically maybe the city might own this stuff. So there are these museums kind of float in space and, the, and these independent ones often start as um, civic entities and become floating nonprofit organizations. Um, and the standalone ones have the sweetest, simplest governance there is. They have a board of trustees and a director and the curators. So it's pretty clear what's going on. Something like the American Museum in New York has something that is approaching this, although John might tell me it's a little bit more complicated than that in his day-to-day -day business. But it's a, uh, in, in some ways, the easiest kind of museum to make a decision in because you actually can have some command and control structure on how you run your organization. The Denver Museum, uh, like many of these museums, founded in 1900, opened in 1908 in Denver, in City Park, was in part founded for two reasons. One was people were really stressed out about the environment. Now you think that's a late 1900 kind of thing, but in fact, in the late 1800s in Colorado, the mining had stripped all the forests off the Rockies to make mining timbers. And all the people were searching for wild protein and extirpated the bison from Colorado. And in fact, this big statue in front of the Denver Museum is entitled The, the Grizzly's Last Stand, because the grizzlies were gone from Colorado. And what they were realizing was that as people were moving across the landscape, they were messing it up. And there was a sense that, boy, the museums rather should be in this business of talking about conservation. This is the same time as the beginning of the National Parks Movement and conservation and Roosevelt. So ironically, our, our, we feel like the discovery of Earth Day in 1970 is a new thing, but it was really back there in 1872 as they started thinking about, boy, you know, we're, we're making a mess of the joint. There also then was the deployment of these museum men. These guys said, look, it's not just about the story, it's about the audience. And I love these guys. Jesse Dade Figgins started at the American Museum, came west. This guy, Philip Reinheimer, was uh, a refugee from the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War. His, his parents moved him from Alsace to get him out of the cycle of wars in Asia. His family moved to Pittsburgh. He became an iron worker in Pittsburgh um, and then got um, tuberculosis and came west for, the, for his health, ended up being a, a park policeman in the park, at City Park, and then uh, Figgins hired him to run the coal-fired furnace in the basement of the museum and realized that two things, that, that Reinheimer knew how to work steel and he loved fossils. And over the next 30 years, Reinheimer collected and mounted all of these fossils in a distant echo of like what was going on back here with Marsh and Cope. But Reinheimer could actually do his own things. They, they actually chipped a Diplodocus out of a rock and mounted it in 18 months. If I could do that now, I'd be pretty psyched. It's costing me like a million dollars in two years for the same project. Um, but they also built dioramas because dioramas in the last century were the way that you took your public places. There was no television, there was no video, there was no travel. If you wanted to go to Africa, it was kind of impossible. So they brought Africa to you. And they would send groups of taxidermists and artists and scientists out to a place and they'd collect that place. Yes, they would shoot the animals and they'd collect the plants, and they'd drag it all back and they'd build it into the museum. And in Denver, they went nuts. Like the American Museum, like the Field Museum, like Milwaukee, they built diorama after diorama. And here's, here's the history of dioramas per decade at the Denver Museum. And they cranked them out. There's 104 dioramas in the Denver Museum today. And they're remarkable things. I mean, if you stand in front of a diorama, which most people tend not to do now, they tend to walk past them looking for the exhibits. <laughs> if you do look at them, and it took me years being in the museum to realize that dioramas were actual places. And the day I realized it, I said, let's go find that actual place. Let's go back and see if we can relocate that place. And so I said to my staff in Denver, let's try and find every one of our dioramas. And it was this incredible task because uh, can you, I guess that's the diorama, and this is the place. <laughs> I mean, when you find one, it's a shocking situation. And then sometimes you find things where like, it's not exactly the same, but we're getting close. You can see where the artists sort of made their tricks. But um, you can go and locate those spots, which means the dioramas are in fact time capsules of a place. 
They're like any other museum specimen. It's a sample of what the world was like at that spot at a certain point in time. And they're remarkable. You see things like power lines disturbing this one. Um, what we found was the 104 dioramas, sometimes we had no idea where they even were or the label was wrong. We didn't know where to start. And this one was allegedly somewhere on the Kenai Peninsula. But the Kenai Peninsula is a pretty big place. So we had no idea where it was. They did the field work in 1961. They installed it in 1968. We had no idea. And then I had that great museum moment. And you know, there's, as a museum worker, there are these museum moments where either somebody shows up and gives you an amazing thing, or they call you up and tell you they discovered an amazing thing, or they come with a piece of amazing information that puts two and two together. But I was sitting in my office and I got a call from the front desk and the information person said, this guy wants to talk to you. I went out and talked to him, he said, you're not gonna believe this. My master's thesis area is one of your dioramas. I was like, which one? He said, the Kenai Peninsula. I'm like, yes, we now know where it is. <laughs> so if you look at this diorama, there's this little lake down in here. And there's the guy at that lake. So we knew exactly where it was. And the amazing thing was that that field was done in 1961. If you go to that spot now, the glacier is 400 feet lower than it was in 1961. So these things are not just time capsules for human activity. They're, they're capsules for climate change and other kinds of things. You know, it's what you start finding these things. And we, we ended up finding almost all the Colorado ones. We're like 35 and counting at Denver. There's the site of that diorama now. One thing that became abundantly clear to me working at Denver is that for all the energy we put into building exhibits and doing programs, we're still very, very, very much in the early stages of understanding how museums impact people. And we know that they do. You'll talk to people that say, like, you know, I, was, I had this experience when I'm, I went to a museum when I was a kid and I became a nuclear physicist. There's lots of examples when you talk to scientists that they'll refer to one of five or six different reasons which drove them into the field of science and one of them is a museum experience. We know that there's this long fuse of the museum experience where kids walk in and then something happens to them and then 30 years later they're doing something in the sciences. But you know, from the point of view of uh, building an effective program, it's hard to, to reverse engineer that. And what did you do that made that kid become a scientist? It's hard to build a program that will do that, except kind of doing what we do, which is sort of an inefficient way of thinking about it. And if you look at this group of people, just cast your eyes across the group of people, and you'll see that there's all sorts of things. There's a grandmother and a grandchild. There's a mother with a young baby. There's a, a, you know, a father with a daughter, maybe a daughter's friend. There's maybe a, a guy by himself. There's a mother and maybe a daughter. Like Multi-generational families, all sorts of ages, all sorts of different capacities to learn and take in information. And tons of them. They're just pouring in. Because it's a fun, social, interesting place. It's, that's what a museum is for people. It's a fun, social, interesting place. Meanwhile, behind that wall, there's some scientist toiling away on his lifetime monograph on dung beetle penises. <laughs> and an amazing collection of dung beetles. So how do those things actually fit together is really kind of the central question of natural history museums. But increasingly in a world where everything is changing so fast and where the relevance of museums is so tied directly to their their uh, ability to function, attention towards the audience needs to be more and more really, really understood. And different museums have different audiences. You have a very different audience here than we have in Washington, D.C. than we did in Denver. In Washington, D.C., five out of six people that walk into the building are tourists in the United States. One out of, so five out of seven are tourists in the United States. One out of seven is from overseas. One out of seven is from the Washington, D.C. area mainly a tourist museum. In New York, a surprisingly large number of international visitors. It's like more than half of the visitors at the American Museum are international. What's the difference between Washington and New York? I mean, and on and on. Every museum has got a different visitor profile. And if you don't understand your visitor profile, you have hardly any way of understanding what you want to achieve with your visitors. Other than, you know, if you're giving them a nice, happy social time. But if you want to actually impart messages or communicate, it's really important to know who your visitors are and what they value and how they learn. 
Now, I had this great experience in, in Colorado that, that really drove home to me the impact of museums in a way that I could never have predicted because my whole experience in museums in my whole life was that there are diverse places. The collection managers are over here and the curators are over here and the volunteer people are over there and the programming people are over there and the fundraisers are over there and the directors are over there, the board's there. They're all kind of doing their own thing. They weren't, they're not really playing team ball. They're kind of focused and sometimes they're fighting. They're like disagreeing about where they should spend the dollars. But this particular example is the only time I've ever seen a big museum completely act like a team and focus on one thing for a short period of time. And it was awesome when that happened. It was so awesome. And what happened was that in Snowmass, Colorado, the ski area of Snowmass, there's a Snowmass village, there's a little lake right here, which is a very curious lake because it's on top of a ridge. And in a general geomorphological sense, you typically don't get lakes on tops of hills. They're usually at the bottoms of hills, right? It's a general rule. But at this particular spot, there's a lake on top of a hill. No one really thought much about it, but the city of Snowmass bought the lake and started scooping out dirt to make a little reservoir to put water in so they could make snow at the beginning of the winter. And the first bulldozer blades at the bottom of the lake turned up a curious sight. Mammoth and Macedon bones both. Mammoths and Macedons both. Kind of unusual because you usually find mammoths in old grasslands and Macedons in old forests, but you know, and I got the call. The guy called and said, hey, we, we hit something that is definitely not a cow. <laughs> <laughs> so I zoomed up there and it was one little beautiful baby mastodon, or mama, sorry. And while I was there looking at it, the bulldozer drove by and pronged up a four foot femur down in the hole. I'm like, this is amazing. So I was in my talk to lawyer clothes, not my dig fossil clothes. And I rushed down there and just started digging with my hands. And I was pulling out ivory tusks and leg bones and things. So we, we assessed it very quickly. And at Denver, we had all the pieces of a functional museum. We had great collections care and conservation and, and registrars and collection managers and the ability to handle things at a fossil prep lab. We had scientists. We had a public programming staff. We had fundraisers, all kind of there ready to be deployed. And we had hundreds of volunteers who had been training to become citizen scientists. So within a, two days, we had 40 people in the hole. And soon I arrived with an army. <laughs> a shovel army and we cut a deal with the, with the owners of the reservoir because legally it was a little bit obscure if the state engineer had more power than the state archaeologist and we could have gone on the path of fighting them and we might well have lost and we said look there's got to be a win-win in this space somehow and we negotiated this deal where they gave us 70 days to dig out the pit and we figured, you know, you could dig anything you want, even enough people, enough shovels. And we attacked the pit with incredible vigor. It was like building a dam in China in 1950. Just like everybody's got a shovel and just going like mad. And we found incredible things. <laughs> incredible things. In 70 days, we got 6,000 bones parts of 50 mastodons, a dozen mammoths, giant ground sloths, giant bison, uh, something like 70 ivory tusks, full-size tusks, um, and just miraculous fossils. This bison latifrons skull is almost seven feet wide from broken horn tip to broken horn tip. Just amazing things. And what was so cool was at the same time we were digging it, we didn't have any money to do it, but our fundraisers kicked into gear. We started raising the funds. Our educators started building giant puppets. We built this miniature museum in Snowmass Village in 26 days and opened a museum on site. We had a school program that went to every single class in the Roaring Fork Valley and saw 50,000 kids while the dig was going on. We were able to broadcast live from the site at winter at 9,000 feet to classrooms all around the country on two-way um, two-way broadcast. I could stand on that site and I could talk to 10 classrooms simultaneously and they could see me in the snow and watch my guys lift husks out of the ground and I could hear like 10,000 kids gasping. <laughs> it was awesome. 70 days. 70 days we moved 7,000 tons of dirt by hand. And at the end of 70 days we'd raise enough money to pay back the owner of the property for all their costs. 
They then finished the reservoir on time under budget and the museum had this amazing thing. We turned around and did a Nova show, a book, an exhibit, opened a permanent museum in Snowmass and dropped the bronze mastodon on the step of the Denver Museum um, last fall. Four years from basically this year to now. And it's what you could do if the whole museum is just like, this is a good idea, let's all do this one thing. <coughs> Never seen it happen before in my life. I hope I can see it again somewhere. I'd love to see it at the National Museum. That would be really incredible if you could focus that kind of energy on one thing. So here we are at the National Museum, this massive, massive challenge. Uh, again, a very curious organizational structure. Uh, it turns out that as the director I report up to the secretary of the Smithsonian, who himself reports the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court <laughs> in a very curious bit of American history. And John Roberts shows up to the meetings, runs them, and scares the crap out of everybody. <laughs> it's like it's just the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is running the museum meeting. But we also have an advisory board, and we have a lot of curators that are the National Museum curators, but we also have curators that come from four different federal agencies, NOAA, Department of Defense, USDA, and USGS, and from several other Smithsonian units. So of the many, many, many scientists in the museum, some of them report to me. <laughs> It's uh, where persuasion is very important. Think about this place, world's largest natural museum collection, check on the first box. Largest base museum staff, check on the second box. Largest natural museum attendance, check on the third box. And then, dedicated staff, 1,200. Dedicated volunteers, 1,200 more. Solid federal funding, I get about $50 million a year straight from the feds, another $30 million through the Smithsonian. And then a growing endowment because for the first time the Smithsonian is actually fundraising. And it's a pretty interesting thing to see what people perceive to be a federal thing actually fundraising. We have a private arm and if you think about it, James Smithson's original gift was the first endowment gift to the Smithsonian. Um, the central location on the Washington Mall is not to be minimized. That's probably the single most important informal science education piece of real estate in the planet, if you think about it. It's in the, you know, right in the middle of the government of the world's most powerful nation. And it, many, uh, I had a French visitor who said, it's like, very curious to me how you guys wrap your government in museums, which is an interesting and lovely concept. No admission fee, no demographic knife that slices who can come and who cannot come. We saw this in London when the Natural History Museum went from being charge-based to free. Their attendance went from 1.5 million to 5 million. So it's very clear that people want to go to the museums and can't afford to pay the fee. I learned today that the two art museums are free, but this museum is not. That would seem to be a, a target worthy of thinking about, is how to make this a free museum and how to take away the demographic knife that slices off the people that want to come to this museum but can't afford to come to the museum. Strong partnerships and of course the brand of the Smithsonian Institution. So if you think about that museum, we've got all these interesting assets, a zillion interns pouring in, um, interns at various levels, these are college interns. One of the things that museums are finding, and this is sort of across the board in museums, is that diversity is a real challenge. We find that our audiences tend to be very well weighted to white and affluent. Often in cities that have lots of people that are less privileged or people of color, the, the actual demography of people attending the museum are white and affluent. And it's hard for people to attend those museums because A, they have to pay to get in or maybe they're on college campuses, or maybe when they go there they don't see anybody that looks like them at all. So one of the, the simplest ways to solve that that has been found at several museums around the country is just hire local kids for the summer. Pay them 2,000 bucks instead of having them go work at McDonald's, they work at the museum. You can go in and find every neighborhood in your town, find out where the underprivileged neighbors are. It doesn't cost that much. You can put 20 or 30 of them or 50 or 60 of them to work at 2,000 bucks a pop. It's just simple to just pay local kids to work in the museum. Because when you do that, then their families come, their friends come, they feel like they're part of the museum community. The museum, with paying a bunch of kids from the local neighborhoods to work in the museum, suddenly you've got a connection to the local neighborhood and the local people. It's just dead simple. 
And it's very cheap, it turns out. It's one of those aha moments in the museum world where it's like, oh, that's, that's what we do. And if you start thinking about it, then these kids get to know scientists. They get to be proud of the museum. They get to be articulate. It gets them into college. They come back as an intern. They do a good job there. So they get a research project, gets them into grad school. And it's sort of this sort of step of stepping up people into the space. And instead of waiting to hire a diverse pool of curators, which takes a lot of time and it's hard to do that, start with your staff and make teenagers your staff, your face of the museum. It's an amazingly powerful tool. Here I am um, deputizing 600 junior paleontologists. Turns out the Smithsonian has the power of convening, so you can call people and it will show up and you can deputize them. And, <laughs> and uh, this is, there's a little story here. This is Matt Carano. He's the curator of Dinosauria at the National Museum. And I will claim credit for this because when I was working here at this museum, I was down in P19 in the basement, and I got a phone call. And it was a 12-year-old Matt Carano trying to get the entomology department. So he wanted a job interning in entomology. So I said, no, you don't want, you don't want insects. <laughs> you want paleontology. <laughs> we hired him as an intern, and now he's the curator of dinosaurs at the National Museum. Sorry, entomologists in the room, but this is a competitive game. <laughs> now, Here's what he's doing, if you notice, he is talking to a young lady who's dressed in a princess dress. She has a little stuffed panda. And in her hand is a really nice dinosaur bone from Maryland that she found. She actually found a nice dinosaur bone in Maryland, walking with her parents. And Matt is negotiating the donation of this. <laughs> <laughs> and don't tell me that this experience is not going to be burned into that girl's brain forever. So our collections, you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that these big museums have global collections. We've collected from around the world. And if you think about this, the, the thousands of museums of the world have collected the world for 300 years more or less and have about 5 billion objects. There really is some, a concept of the one world collection. All the stuff that our species has collected to help us understand this planet. And each museum holds a little bit of that world collection. One of the biggest challenges in museology is knowing what's in the world collection. Because we don't even know what's in our own collection. If you go to the website here, you'll learn that there was Hiram Bingham and O.C. Marsh and Brontosaurus. Or you can go onto the, the very granular website and search for Placentisaurus and come up with 7,000 different individual Placentisaurus. But there's a big gap between the every single thing and the big picture. And I'm trying to figure out how to fix that gap. I think I have an idea. But when you look at these vast Smithsonian collections, realize also that it's really incredibly important for museums to plan their collecting when they can. I mean, these collections are humongous. And, you know, people say, well, just digitize the collection. But think about this. I mean, digitizing 128 million objects is, in fact, not a trivial task. Because it's hard to digitize stuff. I mean, how do you digitize a blue whale jaw, you know? Um, so, I think the other thing is that it really is important for collections to always be improving. Adding new important things that you have a reason to collect, maybe deaccessioning things that, are, that don't make sense, and that's a very strong curatorial decision. I think that deaccession is widely misunderstood by people who guard the collections as, you're just trying to get rid of my stuff. But if you actually look at it carefully, a collection's improved by both focused editing additions and subtractions, and really understanding why you have what you have and what you intend to keep having. I felt we needed a T-Rex, so we acquired one um, with, at zero cost, which is the key thing. I got it from the US Army Corps of Engineers, and it's now the nation's T-Rex. Uh, and then large museums have the capacity to do things that I think are interesting for the museum world. And, and one of my my hopes is that we can start to build a network of museums. We can start to fold these museums and the planet together because we're all kind of trying to do the same thing, but all working alone. So the concept of everybody in the museum working as a team, what about the concept of all the museums working as a team? What about that concept? What about focusing all the museums on some concepts? And so things like the Encyclopedia of Life, a web page for every single species in the planet which I thought was impossible. 
And uh, when I interviewed for the job, I said, that's impossible. I said, we've already done 1.1 million. I'm like, no, oh, maybe it's possible. Uh, or this effort that we're launching called the Global Genome Initiative, which is to, do, to sample broadly across the tree of life and put on ice genome grade tissues of the whole tree of life, probably at the level of families. There's only 9,000 families. You could probably get 9,000 families or maybe half of those. Um, and when it comes to exhibits, there's this sort of space of like how far can you push your audience? How, can, how far can you push your audience to have them keep up with the incredible rapid pace of science as science is evolving? All of you know science is just cranking along. And how do we do that? And then the question of digitization. I mean, I would say that sort of two big disruptive technologies that are hitting museums right now are the digitization question and the genomics question and the big data that comes with that. But you, with the ability to 3D scan things now means that your brontosaurus can be shared with everybody. Or we could put all the brontosaurus in the room, in the world together in a single room, which is kind of a cool concept. And at the same time, people are changing. And I, I love this New Yorker thing because if you work at museums, you know that people now walk around museums like this. I mean, this is, this is standard museum walking behavior. It's, iPhone in front of your face. This didn't happen before 2006, and now they're ubiquitous on the planet. There's over 6 billion cell phones in use right now, and a planet with only 7 billion people. And particularly magnetic for small people. You all have children, have watched what you do. You know, if you really want your kid to shut up, you just give them your iPhone, and it's over. They shut up, and you never see them again. So, and this kid's going to... You know, will his museum experience be the same as my museum experience? I kind of don't think so. So do we, how do museums adjust to that? So at the end of the day, you kind of ask yourself, what's the why? Why are we even doing this in the first place? And I want to just give you a quick why, which is this place is changing fast. I mean, if you look at the human population curve, it is one of the most remarkable curves that you've never seen. I mean, unless you're reading kind of obscure population literature, you rarely see the actual curve of how many people are on the planet and when they got here. And what's even more amazing is you really get, you really get a sense to actually personalize it. So this is the last 20,000 years. And for about 19 and a half thousand of those, we stayed well below a billion. And then all of a sudden we're at seven billion two and climbing. But do this, just put your family on here. My grandfather was born in 1879, my mom in 29, me in 60, and my nephew and niece in 2012. So I knew my grandfather quite well. He was 21 years old when O.C. Marsh died, and I still knew him. I mean, the, tw the 19th century and the 20th century have just sipped past. Uh, we've doubled life expectancy in the last 160 years. So we actually, by the people you know, you know the 19th century, but think about this. By the people you know, that's my nephew and niece, I know the 22nd century. Kids are born in 2012. If they live to be, you know what, 88 years old, they will see 2100. They will be 22nd century citizens. By the time they're my age, there'll be 10 billion people on the planet, which is remarkable. Time is flying fast. This subdivision went in when I lived in Denver. It wasn't there when I got there. It was there when I left. The, the curves that we see about what's happened since 1945, the Great Acceleration, are remarkable. You can make the argument that the baby boom generation is the single most impactful generation of mammals to ever live on the planet. Think about that, born in 1946 to 64, that generation did some stuff. I mean, look at the networks of, of the planet, so we have changed the planet so much, Bolivian rainforest in 75 and in 2003, or, or the Jonah oil and gas field in 1994 and in 2006. Uh, and then you, you, know, we, you hear this in so many ways from so many people, but Anthropocene 1.0 is what I call the direct hand of an increased population. These are what people are doing to appropriate habitats and directly overfish or directly kill things. There's the last, some of the, two of the last northern white rhinos. There's something like four of them left alive on the planet right now. But Anthropocene 2.0, that's the indirect, the things that are driven by humanity but come back around and get you from the top. And of course, the carbon emissions into the atmosphere Again, following very nicely the Great Acceleration, look at 1946, and there goes the baby boom generation up to the top. 
or the incredible Keeling curve, which plots measurements of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere from, and I love this, uh, the year my mom and my dad met, and I was conceived here, and I was born there, and here I am now. This curve is my life. It's just my life. And the composition of the Earth's atmosphere has seen a, a, something like a 25% increase in carbon dioxide. In my life, the planet changed that much. We live in very interesting times. In Colorado, I watched the forest die. The pine bark beetles were not evident in Colorado. Here's a picture taken about the middle of the 2000s. When I got there in, um, in 1990, there was hardly any evidence of pine bark beetle death. And by the time I left, the forests of Colorado had basically been cleaned of various kinds of spruce and pine. Because in the high mountains of Colorado, the winters weren't as cold as they used to be. There was 20 years without a minus 40 freeze in the central part of the Rocky Mountains. And watching things, now that we have satellites, like the satellites of the North Pole, we can actually see that the Arctic sea ice, at its minimum, it waxes and wanes, comes all the way down to here in the winter, goes back, and this is what it was in 1980, when I worked in the high Arctic. I worked in the ice up there. And then what, here's what it was in 2012. So we're seeing these impacts of sea ice retreat, CO2 emissions going up, temperature going up, ocean acidification, sea level rise. All these things are the sort of Anthropocene 2.0, which by and large, we haven't seen the real dramatic effects of yet. Jeremy Jackson, who's sitting in the audience, gave a really interesting talk in Panama last week when I saw him there, because he's every, absolutely everywhere I go. Um, but the talk was, and I quoted the talk several times, he did an assessment of Caribbean reefs from 1970 to 2012. And what he concluded was that the health of the reefs in the Caribbean, or the lack of health, we're largely due to direct human impact, whether it's overfishing or uh, increased uh, nutrients in the sediment, in, in the reefs, or, um, or development, or sewage, those kinds of things, that the actual impact of warming and acidification hasn't really hit yet. So he's really talking about the reefs being an Anthropocene 1.0 version, not a 2.0. Is that a fair characterization? Few. So, I always say back to this tool thing, we, we happen to be, all of us in this room, either employees of museums or on the board of museums or directors of museums, we happen to find ourselves at the peak of our own personal power curve at this absolutely unique moment in human history. This is not like it was in the 1900s, the 1800s. It's absolutely unique. The human growth population curve is going straight up. So we've never been there before, it won't be there for long. It'll go up and it'll do something. We don't know what it's gonna do. 2050, it'll be nine or 10. And then what happens next is kind of interesting. And here we are, running 19th century museums. And this is your moment to, to actually take that tool, that 19th century tool, and use it to fix a 21st century problem. It's a really interesting challenge. And it, the question then is like, well, how healthy is it? You know, how healthy is the industry? It's kind of interesting. You look at our, here's the population curve and the inflection there in 1946. You can watch how the curve of population jumped up. We came in, we came out of World War II with less than three billion people and up it went. But look at the museums, all of them, they're straight up 19th century museums from a different time. How are they relevant to the 21st century? the single driving question of people that run museums right now. Now, there was kind of a run at this thing. What happened in the late 50s was Sputnik got launched. And there was a panic in this nation about, crap, we're not doing a good enough job educating scientists in this country. We've got to change science literacy. We've got to do stuff. And out of that grew a new kind of museum, a museum called the Science Center. And you can see that the, the real leaders in this field were Bradford Washburn, who took what was an old Natural History Museum in New England and turned it into the Boston Science Museum. And Frank Oppenheimer, who built this very innovative Exploratorium in 1969 in, in San Francisco Bay. And all these other science centers popping up really in the time of the early baby boomers in response to a desire for more science literacy. And what is a science center if not a Natural History Museum stripped of its collections and its research? Scientists don't work at science centers. It's all about science education. They focus 100% on the audience, not 30% audience, 30% collections, 30% research, which means 
they're not actually paying for research and collections, which means that they're more nimble financially than natural history museums. Now, these are great organizations. They do fabulous work. But one of the patterns is kind of interesting. I mean, and they do things like this. They, they have many ways of directly impacting the audience that delights the audience. They're very good at knowing what the audience wants. So one of the arguments for natural history museums is pay attention to science centers because they actually know their audience in a way that we don't. It's a straight up thing because they don't have anything else. They don't have collections of research. They just have audience and they, they're tuned to their audience. One of the bad ramifications is this. I think they're driving natural history museums out of business. And one of the ways I've been tracking this thing is counting curator counts at museums. And this is just the three big museums in North America. The National Museum down at 80 from a high of 120. American History, the National Museum in New York, incredibly flat at sort of the 41, 42 number for a long time. And then the Field Museum with some interesting dips and now at an all time low of at 22 curators. But if you look at so the, a bunch of museums in North America and ask the question, how many of these museums lost curators, had erosion of their curator count in the last 20 years? It's kind of scary, the red ones did. The count of curators in North American museums has been going down steadily. And what happens when you lose your curators? The collections become irrelevant and the museum stops moving. And what's going on? These museums are all in cities with very successful science centers. They're competing head to head for the audience. And what drives the business model of natural history museums? People are paying for the gate. People don't come, you don't have any money. And at the end of the day, there is this very interesting straight up business competition model where natural history museums are losing at the expense of science centers. And again, I'm not against science centers. I think they should both be playing team ball on this thing, but there's a very interesting pattern emerging here. And what's happening is that a lot of natural history museums are changing the name to museums of nature and science to try and grab that name in the marketplace. That happened in Denver. Denver did a successful fending off of a new science center. And you'll see that during that period of time, Denver's number of curators grew, it doubled, because it was able to fend off a science center coming into the marketplace. So uh, I've never given this talk at the American Association of Science and Technology Centers because it would be perceived as a very hostile talk, I think. <laughs> it's merely a pattern. I mean, I'm just looking at why is it that we're not competing well for the same exact audience. So, that, and, and I'll, I'll wrap with this concept. I, I started thinking, how do you actually make progress in this space. And one of the things I realized was there, there are actually not that many very large museums in the world. And if I, like, let's just say this, a lar very large museum, let's define it as saying it's got more than 20 scientific curators, it's got more than a million specimens, and it's got more than a million visitors annually. It turns out that there's only about 10 of that size in the world, which is pretty amazing, right? Um, only 10. Of the 7,000 museums, there's only 10 that you could describe as very large. So I started thinking, that's interesting, because they're very large, they've got a lot, they have a lion's share of the collections, they have a huge audience, they've got a lion's share of the curators. I wonder if anybody's ever gotten them all in the same room before. Have you ever gotten the directors of those 10 museums in the same room? And it turns out that no one had ever pulled that off, and so two weeks ago we pulled it off in Chicago. It was amazing. We got the 11 top museums in the world in one room, the directors of. And this group of 11 people oversees 26 million annual visitors, 500 curators, and 487 million objects. This is like 10 to 15% of the One World collection in these 11 buildings. It's a remarkably high percentage of the world's museum impact with a remarkably small number of individuals. It makes me worry about these museums because there are a lot of them are in capital cities. It makes me worry about um, things like disasters and terrorism because we're actually exposed. This group of museums probably holds something like 60% of the world's type specimens in 11 buildings. I mean, what other industry do you have 60% of the whole industry in 11 buildings? It's a remarkable thing. So I, I kind of leave you with this double thing, which is we've got uh, a dual challenge in the planet right now. We've got 
as museum people, we are the stewards of these incredible 19th century tools that hold the heritage of our species knowledge of the planet in trust for the public. And we all know that the information embedded in those collections is relevant to what's happening on the planet at this very moment. At the same time, the planet is changing so rapidly, both from Anthropocene 1.0, the growth of human population, the direct impact, and Anthropocene 2.0, the indirect impact of humanity. And we know that this thing is going towards a peak at about 2050, and we run museums and we're in charge of them. Go. 